This week, mood moulding music. Dan drives dangerously. <laughs> and tiny tot Tootsie Tech. Hey, welcome to Click. This week, we want to make you feel good through the medium of music. I don't know about you, Laura, but I've been listening to a lot, a lot of music in the last year. I love a good tune to run to, but I do find it quite difficult to decide what music I want. So I end up downloading one song and then just having it on repeat for the whole of my 5K. <laughs> Do you do anything like that? Is that weird? Uh, no, I don't. And yes, that is weird. It's not that sea shanty, is it? No. Because that would be like <laughs> too weird. I tell you what, though, sometimes I do find myself listening to a really small set of songs. For me, it's the amazing band Churches, which I think have got me through lockdown, to be honest. I think you've got them through lockdown. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. It's a bit like musical comfort food, though. When I'm feeling down, I just want that familiar sound. Mm, I may not have been doing it, but of course anyone can make a playlist with any music to cater for any mood. Yeah, and that is what Jane Copestake has been looking at, or listening to. Playlists that have been created specifically for you based on where you are right now emotionally and where you want to get to. We've seen how artificial intelligence is being used to compose music from heavy metal algorithms and competitions like the AI Eurovision Song Contest. The way we consume music is also guided by algorithms. Spotify suggests artists and playlists based on our listening patterns. But could this data be used in an even more medicinal way? Companies are exploring ways to use all of this data to create what they're calling prescription playlists, which they hope could one day replace some painkillers or even anti-anxiety medication. The Warren Youth Project in Hull provides mental health support to young people between the ages of 16 and 25. Before the pandemic, it was already using music as therapy. You'll hear people talk about miracle drugs like penicillin and the breakthroughs down through the years, but in actual fact, music is the miracle drug we've always had. A project called Three Minute Heroes teamed young people up with local bands to make music videos based on their lyrics. We had hurdles, but we had them representing emotional hurdles, things like anxiety and depression, stress, loneliness. And over the course of the video, um, our singer Rory overcomes those hurdles. Is it something that you see in young people in Hull? Or? It's definitely something that we see in young people at Hull and especially at the pandemic it's you know it's multiplied several times. It can be isolation, it can be drug and alcohol abuse, um, it can lead to problems with education and employment. Jake is the first young person at the Warren to trial Medi Music an algorithm designed to pick the perfect playlist of songs to lower your heart rate. Music is academically proven to affect the brain more than any other stimulus. It's already been trialled with dementia patients in the Lancashire Teaching Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust with a reported decrease in heart rate of 22%. A trial is currently underway with 40 NHS doctors and nurses at the same trust who are working in critical care during the pandemic. And can you talk us through those devices in front of you? Yeah, sure. So what we've decided to do is build our own device. This is what we're looking to move towards. It's been designed to just focus on the delivery of music with no distractions you would normally get when looking at a smartphone. And then on the bottom of that, there are there'll be additional modules that are measure heart rate variability, which is a good indicator of stress, and hopefully, ultimately, uh, something that will measure cortisol via a wearable. For Jake's playlist, only six songs were chosen, but the algorithm can handle up to 400. The music chosen is not necessarily what you'd imagine. Like, because it doesn't sound very relaxing. Like, 
punch the clock. <laughs> no, well, that's what I thought. <laughs> I thought albums, it doesn't seem yeah. like relaxing music. When I went away and listened to the playlist, I think I definitely was calm there. I was definitely very engrossed while listening to it. It's a really easily accessible um, piece of kit. It has potential to just help as an additional tool to alleviate those pressures and those concerns that young people have around their mental health well-being. And for us, it's you know imperative that we try and deal with these emerging issues as quickly as we can using any methodology or opportunity that we can get our hands on. There is very little doubt the effect music has on us and its ability to capture the mind. A Spanish charity called Music to Awaken uploaded a video tribute to former prima ballerina Marta Gonzalez. She was suffering with dementia and suddenly hears the swan theme from Swan Lake. Further trials of its use are needed, but many music estimates its algorithm, as well as reawakening imaginations, could cut the costs of some medicines by a quarter. That was Jen. Now, eight and a half years ago, after I had a baby, I tested a whole batch of baby tech. Some of it was really useful, but other items just seemed a bit questionable. How could a gadget know better than a mother's instinct? Yeah, I remember a smartphone app which told you when your baby needed feeding. To be honest, I could never hear it over my baby yelling at the top of his voice that he was hungry. Exactly. So I've been taking a look at some of the newer baby tech that's out there. I didn't have a baby for it this time round. <laughs> <laughs> I enlisted the help of some other new parents. Poor sleep isn't just a problem for the grown-ups. Babies can suffer from it too. Owlet's connected sock collects oxygen and heart rate data via a light monitoring blood flow under baby's little toe to let you know how well they're resting. The camera can be linked to the system too. As first time parents in the night we're quite uh, prone to checking her all the time and so having it just on the phone without having to disturb her was helpful. I definitely referenced it a few times a night to make sure she was still breathing and all that usual stuff. It does need charging every day though, and in reality could cause some concern. You sort of can overcheck these things, I think, sometimes, and you know, because you've got it there on your phone, the temptation just to look. I think we had it badly placed on her once, or I was jigging her to get her to sleep, and they couldn't get a reading. Um, <coughs> Dina. That could make you anxious. So can it really justify its 280 quid price tag? If you were really worried about your, your child for any, you know, any medical reasons, then I think it could be quite reassuring. Data could help new mums with breastfeeding though. Some do feel really strongly about wanting to do it, but can face challenges. I think a lot of it is worrying because breastfeeding is such that you don't actually see physical transfer is the process of worrying that leads to interventions that then result in reduced breast milk supply. So how about this smartphone connected scanner? It measures how established breast milk is via the levels of ions present. Basically the mother just takes a few drops of milk, introduces into this tiny um, a, a milk chamber and then connect this chamber with the device and then the device senses the electrochemical properties of this tiny human milk sample this information is being transferred directly to the mother's smartphone to generate immediate insight the algorithms are based on data from over 800 milk samples and lactation consultants have uploaded details of hundreds of feeds. Usually the device shows me that I was right, uh, but it might help us see something earlier than the human eye would detect. Mothers also get to see how they're getting on. It's very calming. When you get the app and it's all green, it gives you a scientific sign that you're doing okay because mostly you are doing okay and it's, and it's all in your head. And when it's not, it tells you it's not. 
and some other tools can track how much milk a baby is actually getting. Like this smart nipple shield. It's app showing mothers how much milk is flowing past its sensor without needing to express. How much milk does a woman on average in Ireland versus Russia versus UK versus Brazil? What's the typical breast milk volume? Nobody knows that. Countries with really good maternity leave, you know, are they producing more milk? The device is currently undergoing trials, but hopes to teach us more about the impact of things like polycystic ovary syndrome, diabetes and maternal BMI. If we're able to say that, yes, this woman in the States who has these risk factors, her milk supply is down here, you know, we can prove it. Obviously, there are some benefits in having this kind of data, but on the flip side of this, could it not just cause more anxiety? There is a place for data and having the data to reassure mums that you do have milk, you're doing great, would be good. Um, my worry would be if that comes from a health, a health professional that makes it look as though we are advocating this device in place of you breastfeeding naturally. There would be definitely, um, you know, a balance there too. Hello and welcome to the week in tech. It was the week Amazon signed an $8.45 billion deal to buy MGM, the Hollywood studio known for releasing the James Bond and Rocky franchises. And after being tested in several countries, Instagram now lets users all over the globe hide likes to reduce social media pressure. Uber and Lyft started offering free short rides to people in the United States traveling to get a COVID-19 jab. WhatsApp has sued the Indian government in a bid to block new rules. It claims these rules will lead to mass surveillance by forcing social media platforms to hand over private information about their users. A new app that bans selfies is blowing up online. Paparazzi only allows users to take photos of other people and has no filters, follow accounts or captions. The app's debut is already being compared to the launch of popular apps like Clubhouse, Snapchat and even Facebook. And finally, a robot is helping paramedics save lives by giving CPR. A UK ambulance service is using the device, called Lucas, to carry out chest compressions, freeing up the emergency team to carry out other vital procedures on heart attack patients. Truly a case where robots can help fix a broken heart. I can't be the only one thinking their home is dustier than usual, maybe because we've been spending more time at home during the pandemic. So I thought I'd try out some air purifiers to see if they would help. Now before I get any comments about living in squalor, let me tell you my mum is German and I was raised on the ideology of Lüften, which is to open your windows and ventilate every morning without fail. I obviously also vacuum regularly, but even so, I felt like there's more dust. Maybe because I'm at home more, so I'm creating more dust, or I'm at home more and I'm noticing more dust. Either way, I wanted to fix it. I started off by putting an air quality meter in my bedroom that can detect dust and other fine particles in the air. Basically what that little box is doing is measuring how much dust there is in the air every 15 minutes and then giving you an air quality index or AQI score. It's using a US scale, basically the higher the number, the worse the air quality, and it goes all the way from good to hazardous. <laughs> Here are the results from my first seven days, and you can see that the air quality fluctuated a lot, but the baseline was typically in the moderate zone with a few spikes all the way up to hazardous, which I guess is not great. So I started logging everything I did in my bedroom, so hopefully I could explain some of those spikes in the air quality reading, and then it was time to start the experiment. For my first high-tech intervention, I just opened the window for 24 hours to see whether Lüften really would make a big difference. And here are the air quality results. Now what's cool about this is that all the dust spikes match up exactly with the log I was keeping. So you can see the air quality improved overnight. The dust levels went down. You can see exactly when I woke up and got out of bed and kicked up a load of dust. This is where I was sat on my bed doing some work. And then you can see later when I went to bed to go to sleep, Again, I kicked up a load of dust. 
What was surprising here was that the air quality results actually looked a bit worse with the window open for 24 hours. I don't know if that was just because there was a breeze coming in and so the dust was kept agitated and floating around for longer. It's hard to say. But if you look at the next day's readings with the window closed and no other interventions, overall the dust spikes were lower. Anyway, with that out of the way, it was time for some tech. The first filter I tried was the TCL Breaver. I wanted to include a low cost device so this one doesn't have an auto mode and doesn't have any air quality measuring. You just turn it on or off and you can set a timer for as long as you want. So I left it running on medium for 24 hours. Here's the air quality data from Saturday with no intervention and here it is from Sunday with the TCL Breaver running for 24 hours. As on the other days, the air quality improved while I was asleep, but with the filter running, the AQI went all the way down to zero. And you can see exactly where I got up and kicked up a load of dust again when I got changed in the morning. Later in the day when I had a nap and again wasn't moving around the room, the TCL filter got the air quality index all the way down to zero again. And for a low cost device, I thought that was pretty impressive. The second filter I tried was by South Korea's Dine Air, and this one caught my eye because it used ultraviolet UVC to kill airborne viruses. It's very appropriate in these times. The machine has an automatic mode and built-in sensors, so when it detects a lot of dust in the air, the light turns red and the fan kicks in, which it did as soon as I got up in the morning and kicked up a load of dust. Here's the air quality data from Monday with no intervention, and here's Tuesday when I was running the Dine Air filter for 24 hours. Once again, it brought the air quality index all the way down to zero with no dust detected. And when I did kick up some dust, it quickly brought the levels down again. The final machine I tested was the Dyson Purifier Hot and Cool Formaldehyde, which is called that because it not only removes dust from the air, but can also break down formaldehyde. One thing I did like about this machine is, as well as being a passive air filter, you can also use it as a fan on a hot day to blow air at you and cool you down, which the other two didn't do. And I think if you're gonna have something this big stood around in the home, it may as well be dual purpose. I ran the machine for 24 hours in auto mode, and here are the results. Here's the first day with no intervention, and here's the day running the Dyson Purifier for 24 hours. Now I noticed with this machine, the AQI reading never went all the way down to zero. And I think the reason for that is because according to the app, the target wasn't zero. The target was to keep the AQI score firmly within that good range at all times. And if you look at the data across the day, it did exactly that. Crucially, has all this made a difference? Well, I feel like it has. I certainly feel like there is less dust around. The air quality meter says there is less dust around. And taking a look at the actual air filters shows you how much dust they have captured. Hopefully the biggest change will be getting out of the house more as restrictions are relaxed. But when it comes to air filters, I'm a big fan. That was Chris Fox helping us all to breathe easy. But next, we have something which may just take your breath away. Motor racing is huge, but it's not just the professionals that you may see on the telly. In the UK, over 30,000 people have what's known as a competition license, and lots of others just head to the tracks for fun. All of them are trying to go faster, drive better, and crash less. And now there's a new piece of tech out there which might just give them the edge. And Dan Simmons has been taking it for a spin. This is Thruxton Race Circuit. It's the fastest track in the UK where ordinary road cars can take corners at over 100 miles an hour. Now, for most drivers, what makes the biggest difference to their speed isn't tweaking the car, it's about their driving skills. Took too, too, way too there. much curve there, didn't I? The touring car line there. <laughs> and that usually means getting an instructor to help us improve. Bit of lock on, bit of lock on, and back the other way. That is, until now. Garmin have come up with the catalyst. It wants to make me drive faster. My question is, can it make me the next Lewis Hamilton? And more to the point, is Ben here out of a job? So far, my best time around the track was a 151.6. I was getting faster, but could the catalyst make a difference. 
Now, when you're driving a car around a track, you're aiming to do one thing, take corners really well. It's all about timing, braking in the right place and trying to keep the car on the fastest line. To help with this, the Catalyst uses a camera fitted to the dashboard along with GPS and accelerometers to work out where you are on the circuit. After three setup laps, it analyzes where it thinks improvements can be made and then coaches you in real time as you continue round the circuit. Good job, braking hard. What did it say? Good, good job of braking hard. Okay. Next light, apex later. So that's what it wants me to do, apex later. Yeah, nice. yeah, look nice at, work. It says nice work, so it's sort of encouraging me a little bit. This is my session summary and the Catalyst has picked out some places that it thinks that I can improve on that I didn't really expect it to. I thought it would go for the twisty bits, but it hasn't. It's gone for the long sweeping fast corners. Look at that church it thinks I can improve on. That run up the hill, that fast and sudden braking into the chicane, it thinks that I can do much better. So all it needed was a few more laps. Good turning. <laughs> Good turning. I said it first. <laughs> yes, you did, Ben. I'll give you that. The results were in. It did help me go faster. It helped me straighten out the corners and actually give a little bit more gas in some cases where I was quite willing to sometimes lift off. Would I replace a live instructor with this? Probably not. He's aware of all sorts of things going on in the car, including what's going on for me, whereas at the moment, this isn't. So it's better than nothing, but it doesn't replace Ben. Keep pushing. People need to understand the limitations of what it can do and understand what, what it can't do. Um, and as we experience through the day, yeah, the tyres get hot and, and then they go off slightly. So the lap you did three laps ago, you, you're not going to get near, near again. And so the, the unit telling you to keep trying for that time maybe isn't the safest thing to do. There's also one other feature which is worth mentioning. It's very easy to set new tracks using the device. You just have to drive the same route three times. And that could be anywhere including public roads. Now, the device discourages this through an on-screen warning setup, and Garmin told the BBC that it doesn't encourage any form of illegal activity. But what is interesting is that the device's design team haven't used geofencing to restrict its use to racetracks. Back on track, we wanted to see what it was like with a pro. So we sent 2017 British GT winner Seb Morris around for a spin. <laughs> when we think of cars of the future, we think autonomous self-driving machines. Just told me to apex later, so it means I've obviously turned in a bit too early into that corner. And before, my optimal best was a 1 minute 31.9, which I thought was the limit but as it's taught me around and told me to do a few different things I've actually decreased that lap time. But perhaps this tech presents a better picture for those who enjoy driving. A collaboration between human and machine to create a better driver. But I'm surprised Garmin hasn't taken the opportunity to cross-reference the data with the driver's biometrics using something like their watch range to make things safer suggest break times perhaps and get even more from man and machine. What was this time? 129.9. Oh, I have to do more practice. Oh no, you're gonna have to go round again, Dan. What a shame. Honestly, that was Dan, a reasonably priced star in a car. That's us out of here for this week.
As ever, you can find the team on social media, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon. Bye bye.